Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm joined by Dale Pinkert. He's going to share with us some thoughts on the uh, overall environment. We'll talk a little bit about commodities. We'll talk currencies. A lot of movement in the markets today. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thinking back to a Jesse Livermore quote. There's a time to go long, a time to go short, and a time to go fishing. In a lot of ways, this feels like that third piece. It feels like an opportunity to sort of take a step back and wait for things to evolve. Energy, the only one of the 11 S&P sectors up today. We'll also answer some of your questions from the Final Bar Mailbag. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Final Bar. everyone. Welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the market environment using the power of stock charts, using data visualization techniques to better quantify investor behavior, to better understand price momentum, and better interpret the message that the markets are providing back to us. Embedded in price, there's a lot of color about what investors are thinking, how they're voting with their capital, and we can look at the uh, message of price and trend and momentum, breadth, sentiment, all of those indicators to try to make a better sense of things in uncertain times. Now, a very choppy feel to the day today, and I feel like I've introduced many shows in the last couple of weeks with that same description. Yet another choppy day, but overall, this one netting out more on the uh, on the downside. The S&P at one point uh, dipping below 4,300, actually a couple times during the day, closed right back above that. Uh, level, but overall, certainly to me, seems like we continue to be in a period of distribution. I, you know, I think of the market in three phases: an accumulation phase, a consolidation phase, a distribution phase. I'm seeing plenty of indicators. Days like today, I think, reassert the uh, overall distribution phase that we uh, may be in here. We have great guests on the show. I'm excited to have uh, Dale Pinker join us on the show here in a few moments uh, for the uh, a second time. We also have Craig Johnson from Piper Sandler joining us on Wednesday from Minneapolis. On Thursday, joining us from uh, the East Coast, John Gagliardi, who's one of the uh, regional specialists with uh, Fidelity Investments. Coming up next week, we have Matt Tuttle. Matt is the founder of uh, Tuttle Capital Management. They are creator of a series of ETFs you probably have seen, including the Short Arc Innovation Fund ETF. So a lot of interesting uh, guests coming up along the way. Let's continue on with our market recap. As I mentioned, I would describe this uh, session as choppy, a choppy day among choppy days. Let's look at the evidence and see what the charts are actually telling us. The S&P 500, as I mentioned, closing just above 4,300. That's after dipping below 4,300 a couple times. Now, the reason why 4,300, I think, is an important level is if you look at the S&P and the NASDAQ on a closing basis, what I would call the new Dow theory. We'll go to that chart here in a moment. What I call the new Dow theory, you'll notice uh, that 4,300 uh, is kind of a key level. That's the closing low from October of last year. That's just below the closing low in January. We bounced below there briefly uh, in February. And now on March 1st, we're closing right at that level again. A close below 4,300 sort of confirms the breakdown that you saw with the NASA composite as it broke below 14,200, we'll call it. Both of those getting to a new closing low activates what's called a Dow Theory sell signal, where two major indexes are both breaking down through key support levels. At this point, one has broken down the NASDAQ. The other one, the S&P, is still just barely holding on to 4,300. But again, a day like today, pushing it dangerously close to that threshold. The NASDAQ, about the same if you look at the NASDAQ composite, not far off of the S&P. Mid caps and small caps, both down a little more. Both of those indexes are down almost 2% today. The VIX has pushed now onward above 30. And if you look at some of the previous pullbacks that we uh, saw end of last year, beginning of this year, the VIX sort of topped out just in that 30, 32 range. And all of a sudden we're pushing above there. The VIX is actually pushing a little bit higher than, uh, you know, quote unquote, the normal for the last couple months. Does that mean we're in a period of uh, even further volatility and, and potentially price deterioration? Uh, perhaps. We'll look at some of the charts again uh, through the course of the show and see how we can answer that question. We talked about interest rates yesterday uh, a little bit, and I would tell you overall, you know, there's been this rotation from a lower rate environment to a higher rate environment. I, and I would say over the course of this year, over the course of next year, I'm 
fairly confident we'll be dealing with higher interest rates with, uh, you know, the Fed raising rates. And that is a very different environment than many of us are familiar with or that we've seen uh, recently. However, in the short term, when you have a flight to safety, when you have a lot of people piling into Treasury bonds, that's going to push yields back down. So you have 10-year yield down around 170. Uh, you know, two days ago, it was up above 2%. Uh, yesterday's close, that was on Friday. Yesterday's close, we go below 185. Today, we're down all of, all of a sudden to 170. So you're certainly seeing bonds rallying as uh, as stocks are uh, stocks are rolling over here. The dollar index, by the way, pushing higher. And uh, we we talked about you know the uh, the dollar is sort of an interesting general uh, uh, um, a driver of a lot of other asset. Right. A lot of times when you see movements in equities and other asset classes. It often comes back to the to the dollar. Arguably, gold not really following through to the upside has had to do with a stronger dollar environment. It's interesting to see how the dollar is reacting uh, over the last couple of days, pushing higher versus other currencies. And again, my uh, guest, Dale Pinker, probably has some perspective there that we should uh, we should pay attention to. Commodities pushing higher and higher. And you have energy prices going up. We have uh, the commodity ETF we follow, DBC, up over 4%. Gold up 1.8%. Silver up 4% as well. So Certainly an acceleration to the upside in the commodity space. Crypto is also pushing to the upside as well. Ethereum actually got above 3,000. It had been well below that for quite some time. Two days ago, it's down below 2,600 and now pushing uh, uh, upward above that level. Bitcoin is now back above 44,000. This is after going down in the, uh, in the 30s not too long ago as well. So you certainly saw a move into cryptocurrencies in the last couple sessions. Today, a little choppy, net positive. Uh, but overall continuing to push above previous swing highs. The chart of the S&P 500 looks like this, and I've, I've labeled this as a bear market rally, and, uh, and, and that's what I would describe in, in this environment, where, where basically the longer trend appears to be lower. If you, if you take a step back and look at the chart of the S&P 500, I see a clear pattern of lower highs and lower lows. That's a, that's a chart in distribution phase, right? That's what that means when you have lower lows and lower highs. That tells you that buyers are not coming in and pushing the price above previous highs. Not enough buying power to uh, compensate for the selling pressure that's coming in when you do have those rallies. And potentially today, we're seeing the beginning of another leg lower. We'll have to see how, uh, you know, again, the rest of this week uh, sort of plays out. But right now, as I mentioned before, right in that uh, sort of orange shaded area, which is right around 4,300. 4,300 has been an important level. That was the low in September, uh, October of last year. That was also the low from uh, late January. We broke through that briefly, but on a closing basis, didn't get much below 4,300 uh, about a week ago. And now we're once again sort of right at that, at that point. So 4,300 is certainly a key level to pay attention to. I know a lot of people are seeing this as a head and shoulders top. And I have to admit, it is not an ideal head and shoulders pattern, which would be a much more clearly defined head surrounded by two lower uh, highs, which would be the shoulders. This is a little more of a head and shoulders like pattern is how I would probably describe it. But overall, certainly a basing pattern and a clear level of support that we're threatening, uh, threatening a breakdown. Now, if we would break any lower below current levels, you obviously have to look at uh, a couple, couple, couple points that I would point out. First off, the green shaded area is right around 4,200 to 4,220. That was the intraday low uh, in January. That was the closing low from uh, from last week, and it's also the 38.2 percent Fibonacci level. If you take the January 2022 high and the September October 2020 low, if you take that as the big move higher, we're now retracing uh, about 38.2 percent of the way. If we're right at 4,200 below there, the intraday low that we hit last week was just about 4,100, around 4,120. Uh, so that might be the next downside objective I would have in mind. When I'm looking at the S&P, the thing that caught my mind uh, yesterday as I was reviewing these charts was just the decline in momentum. And I would say two things that, that jump out at me. Number one, steadily declining momentum. So as the market has evolved over the last four months, the RSI has been sloping downwards, particularly the peaks in the RSI. And so that is not telling me the market is great. We're just waiting for the next bounce higher. That is more a marketed deterioration uh, as momentum continues to go downwards. Now, I have to point out what's called the bullish momentum divergence. Look at the lows in January and February and look how the RSI is oversold the first time and not oversold the second time. You're actually seeing that in a number of different charts. If you look at the biotech ETF, for example, XBI or IBB, 
you'll find a similar pattern of a lower lows January into February, higher lows in the RSI. And that could be enough to indicate a short-term bounce, sort of a short-term uh, rally. But again, overall, the question is how much of that is a rally that's changing the, uh, the longer-term uh, flavor of the market versus just a bounce within a longer-term downtrend. Given the deterioration that we've talked about in other areas, I would have to think of it as more of the latter until proven otherwise. Now, on a sector basis, if you look at the 11 S&P sectors, only one finishing in the positive, that's energy. The XLE was up about 1%. After that, you had real estate, healthcare, consumer staples, utilities, some fairly defensive sectors there at the top, particularly REITs, utilities, consumer staples. These are sectors that people usually enjoy owning if they're avoiding owning other things. If you're trying to just hide out and, and navigate sort of uncertain times, those are the types of things I would most likely be buying because they tend to have a, uh, a higher yield component, tend to pay a he heavier dividend, a little lower volatility, uh, which means you can ride out some of the uncertainty pretty well. Financial stocks are getting crushed pretty bad. And let's look at some of these briefly, if we can, Goldman Sachs is a really good example of, I think, the rotation that you've seen in this sector. Now, not too long ago, if you look in early November, these stocks are actually breaking out to new highs. Now, again, Goldman is not the entire sector. There are other stocks in the financial sector, which look a little different than this, but I think it's a good representation of, uh, of, a, of an accumulation phase, meaning a, you know, a, a trend that's moving higher, higher highs, higher lows. That stalls out here in September. You attempt to make a new high in November and fail to follow through above around 420 on Goldman Sachs. We then retested the highs right around 400 there at the beginning of the year. From there, we've broken down through the 200-day moving average. We failed to reclaim that in early February when we rotated higher. And now the previous support level becomes resistance. Now we're retesting those lows. So overall, if you ask me to, uh, you know, gun to your head, which one higher or lower, I'd have to vote lower given the deterioration that you've seen, the fact that it's been unable to hold support. The question is, does that recent low from January hold, which is why it's an important chart to watch now. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, Dale Pinkert. We'll see you in a minute. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the market activity using the power of the technical toolkit, using technical, uh, technical and behavioral tools to better understand the market environment. A couple quick announcements before we get to Dale Pinkert here in a moment. First off, we welcome your questions. We're going to do a mailbag segment a little later in today's show, and we would love to answer one of your questions live on the air in our next mailbag segment at the end of this week. You can get your questions to us via email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. We're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions and hope to answer one of yours live on the air on Friday's show. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. That is our on-demand platform. It is completely free. Great guest appearances like Dale Pinkert and many others, knowledgeable experts, traders, money managers that can share some expertise with you. Also, we have uh, Larry Williams just did a market outlook last week. Martin Pring did a market outlook in January that's uh, worth reviewing. So much great content every trading day. Go to StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device, just search for StockChartsTV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Dale Pinker, joining us on the show once again. Dale is a trading coach with Eagle's Nest, also hosts a fantastic show for Forex Analytics that I've enjoyed uh, coming on. Dale, good to see you and welcome to the show. Thank you, Dave, and I uh, appreciate you inviting me back. A friend of mine, Mike Venezia, said that tough markets don't last, tough traders do. So <laughs> I love don't that. Don't go fishing. Don't go fishing. Hang um, in there. Anyway, Hang in there, right? Uh, that's right. And uh, also, did you say uh, XLE only up 1%? That's right. On your review. So uh, I'd call that pretty weak performance. This chart is not updated. doesn't show the blow-off move that we had today. Uh, peak prices were about 107 in WTI. And interday, we tested the invasion high, which was a little bit above 100 at 155. So what we have right here is a blow-off phase. So, you know, only God knows where the top is. 
Uh, but I know it's such a crowded trade that I wanted to talk about preserving profits during a blow-off stage. Uh, there are things that you could use like trailing stops uh, because it's my view that this stage is very hard to time and out. You're not going to get the top. You're not going to add perfection up here. And there's nothing wrong with just taking profits after a major move that we've had in the oils. Uh, we're almost seeing the opposite here, David, that we saw last uh, in April during the COVID crisis where crude went negative. Mm -hmm. And we had a waterfall decline, and now we're having a parabolic advance in crude. I would say if you start seeing closes in WTI back under 102, 101, you'll know that's uh, shifted if we can close back under the invasion high of 100. <clears throat> and I think that could really set up a liquidation break if that happens to take us back to confluence that I have right around the $80 level. And uh, I know that right now uh, it doesn't look realistic. Uh, but I want to present a narrative. Um, this is really the metals, the dollar, everything's really a war move that we have going on. And I'm not talking about the end of a war, but I'm saying that there is potential for things to reverse. What is Putin's source of funds besides oil? Uh, he, they froze his rainy day fund. It's very mm -hmm. difficult to sell gold. If I was... Uh, President Putin, I would be increasing production right now. It's not in his interest to cut off oil sales to Europe, and it's not in our interest for us to take Russian oil off the market either. So there could be an event that comes out of left field. Perhaps there's one thing that Congress almost agrees on. Um, all Democrats and most Republicans are uh, see that Russia is an adversary. All of them agree China is an adversary. So uh, why not uh, let Putin pump as much as he can and take the market down and his revenue will continue to fall too? So I think it would work for Biden, who looks pretty hopeless here. If we had a break under 80, David, it's going to open the door for 60 again. So I, it's probably uh, uh, seems improbable to most people, but uh, I've seen a few blow off tops in my time. And um, at first, you're really being, uh, you know, you don't have any company. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, the DSI was 92 today in WTI. So if anything, we're at an extreme. Uh, last Thursday on the invasion, DSI was at 10 before the S&Ps put in that reversal day that you were showing before it came on. So I'm saying protect your profits, book some profits. Um, if you're a Michiganer like me, look for reasons to sell the market and take advantage of shorts, look for shorter term divergences. But I wouldn't be surprised if we're within 48 hours of some type of significant inflection point there. And it kind of leads into what I'm going to talk about with the euro currency. Yeah, let's go there to the chart of the euro. We're now looking at a monthly chart of the euro going back to 2010 here, Dale. Yeah, I wanted to give a long term perspective to your viewers. And this trend line, like you're talking about, uh, I have it anchored back in uh, 2014. And, uh, you know, we tagged it again in 19. And sometimes when you have a major trend break like this, you get several tests of that line. And this is actually setting up for the third. Um, on the uh, right around 11040 is where that line comes in. So uh, it's my contention that uh, the euro is very close to putting in what could be an important inflection point, 110.40, 110. Uh, over today's highs or uh, this month's highs, uh, we could have a breakout. And I'm not a Cassandra talking about the end of reserve currency status for the dollar, but a 10 to 20% decline in the dollar, I think, would be welcomed. It would help the emerging markets. I think we mm -hmm. began to see the flows into outside markets away from the U.S. Uh, before the war began. And uh, if I'm right about a turn in the euro, uh, check out your weekly charts. Uh, if you can show that weekly now, Dave, you'll see the glaring divergence that we have at the lower right hand of your cor uh, corner. So looking for an important low, uh, 110 or 109.98 is 78.6 back from the whole move, the low in uh, 2020 mm -hmm. to the high in 2021. 
So there are a lot of dollar bulls, uh, not as many dollar bulls as crude bulls, but uh, this too could be a crowded trade. Uh, a lot of people have uh, been burned trying to pick the top in the dollar. Look at the dollar index, Dixie, say around 98.10 to 98.5, and, and we could be there in short order. So looking for uh, what could be an intermediate term type uh, bottom in the euro and top in the dollar. And instead of it being unwelcome, it would mean Europe's stable. So, so we have to move on. Good. Listen, this is this is Go a ahead. fantastic two charts. And I, and I love that there's a very contrarian feel to our conversation today. And I love encouraging people to think about some of these scenarios and how they might uh, play out. Dale Pinkert, it's great to have you on the show. It's good to see you. Stay safe. Be well. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, David. That's Dale Pinker. Dale's a trading coach with Eagles Nest, also hosts a, uh, a show on Forex Analytics called the, uh, the Face Interview. It's a really good conversation. I've enjoyed getting to know Dale. I, I tell you what, he's a, a, an encyclopedia of market knowledge, but also just the mental challenges and the mental state of, uh, of trading. I think a lot of us have a lot to learn from uh, Dale. Let's continue on with our next segment. Uh, the Final Bar Mailbag. As a reminder, we love to hear from you. Our, our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. Keep your questions coming, and let's get to question number one. I know this is a primarily a traditionally uh, technical analysis channel, a TA channel, but is there any way to discuss quant trading, and if this is something new traders should be devoting time into as well? Of course, in the, in the mailbag segment, we have very little time to devote to, to a, a question that deserves an entire hour-long answer. Maybe we'll do a special sometime talking about some of the quantitative methods, but I would say absolutely. And, you know, if you're not comfortable with what that means, uh, you know, here's what I would say. Um, you know, the, the uh, sort of subjective, the more traditional way of analyzing charts is you look at a chart and you start analyzing it and you identify entry and exit points and you start trading them. What a quantitative methodology, how I would describe it, is looking way more bigger picture. It's more of a bottom-up analysis on a lot of different things. What is your universe? What are all the levers that you can pull? What is your investable universe of stocks, ETFs, futures, whatever it is, and put them in a big Excel spreadsheet or Google Sheets or whatever it is that you uh, decide to use. And then bring in the information that you can. What data can you use to better understand each of those? It could start with price, moving averages, RSI, the scooter rankings, fundamental data, like PE ratios, other valuations. There are a lot of different things you can do. And then start to look at what the data can tell you and, and what a quantitative method would, would essentially mean, my experience, how I would summarize it, is taking a bunch of data, fundamental, technical, whatever different data that you can, and boiling it down into a summary. How would you score these stocks based on the information that you have? Now, you can use Excel or Google Sheets or whatever to create your own model. That's what the stock chart scooter ranking is actually all about. So if you look at our scooter reports or if you go to the top where it says charts and tools and go to the scooter rankings, that is essentially a quantitative model. It is purely technically oriented. So it's a momentum-based, trend-following uh, quantitative model, but that is essentially what a quantitative model does. It takes all of those stocks in that universe of ETFs and it puts them on a percentile ranking. What are the best scoring stocks based on that model? I've worked with a number of financial advisors and individual investors that create their own models using the scooter uh, rankings as one of those inputs. And I'd encourage you to uh, experiment with that uh, for sure. As an example, uh, you know, maybe Gaddis and Grayson Rose's book uh, called Tensile Trading, or I'm paraphrasing the title, something about tensile trading, uh, has sort of a, 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 a preliminary uh, quantitative model. Greg Morris's book, Invest with the Trend, does a pretty good job with that as well. I'd encourage, I'd point you to uh, either of those places. Next question, one of your comparisons you often make is between AD line SPX and AD line NAS. I look at the, um, the uh, breadth on the NASDAQ and the S&P, and here's the chart you're, uh, you're mentioning, I think you're referring to, which is this one here. This is looking at, in this case, the NYSE advanced decline line and the NASDAQ advanced decline line. To continue your question, you stated this comparison is invalid because of the inherent problems with the NASDAQ breadth. Why not make the comparison between the OEX and the NDX? That's the S&P 100 and the NASDAQ 100. This would be more equitable because you're comparing the best 100 stocks in the S&P and the NASDAQ. It's actually a really interesting question, a really interesting um, you know, suggestion that you're making. And I'm going to take a look uh, even uh, a little bit further at it. So what you're referring to is basically when you do exclamation point AD line NYC or NAS or SPX, we have breadth data that we have been uh, managing at Stock Charts. It's our homegrown breadth data based on market data that we've been tracking for years and years. It allows you to do some really cool 
uh, analysis of breadth, looking at market history, and with no survivorship bias. It's the actual data as it came out on every uh, trading day going back over time. The challenge I have with looking at a smaller group of stocks, when you look at the S&P 100 or the NASDAQ 100, you have a smaller list of stocks. That's the problem I would have with that. So, you know, if it moves from 50 to 60, that means 10% of that relatively small group, that's 10 stocks that change position. If you're looking at a broader universe, right, of, uh, of a thousand names or something, the breadth changing means something a little more meaningful because it's an equal weighted measure. And so I like looking at a larger group of stocks when I look at uh, when I look at that, which is why I tend to look at the NASDAQ composite, the NYSE, and the S&P is probably the smallest group of names where I look at breadth data. However, your point is an interesting one. I'm going to take a little more uh, look at it and maybe share some results on the show on another time. Next question, how do you identify credit spreads? How do you see it? Really good question. One of my guests last week, I forget who it was, to be honest with you, that mentioned uh, credit spreads, but we talked about it a little bit. And essentially what credit spreads are, and I'm bringing up a chart as I'm answering your question, what credit spreads are is basically looking at the yield on a particular uh, corporate bond, right? And so a lot of times you'll do a triple A or triple B credit spread. And what that basically means is what's the yield on a triple A rated corporate debt or some index of those bonds relative to treasuries. And that's what the, the spread that we're talking about. It's basically how much are investors at, like looking for, what yield are, looking, are, are investors looking for for owning a corporate bond as opposed to a treasury bond, which is essentially risk-free uh, debt. We don't have a lot of credit spread data on the platform right now. I will tell you one of my roles as chief market strategist that I wish I would spend way more time on sometimes is thinking about additional data sources that we want to have. I'm going to think about credit spreads a little more because I, I, I agree. It's something I used to look at a lot earlier in my career, and I've been able to look at it less and less. We do have an index I'd point you to, double dollar sign H-Y-I-O-A-S is an index from Bank of America. It's called a high yield index option adjusted spread. Don't get too, get too scared by that. Language, what an OAS basically means, it's a spread, but if you exercise all of the options, bonds have a lot of different uh, structural uh, things in an OAS and a job option adjusted spread basically strips all those out. It's more of a pure spread of this, uh, these bonds versus stocks. This is looking at the spread on high yield debt, which are fairly risky companies versus corporate bonds. If the run number is going up, and I'm plotting this inversely, the number goes up, that means investors are asking for more yield. They want to be paid more for owning riskier stocks, and it's more of a bearish sign for stocks. So that's why I'm plotting it inversely, because if this line is going down, Similar to the VIX going up, I've also plotted that inversely, and that tends to line up with the S&P going down. That's a really good chart I would start with if you want to understand credit spreads and how they relate to the S&P 500. We need to wrap this show. Go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Let's get to it. Chart number one is the 10-year yield. We talked with uh, Dale Pinker today about a number of different things. I, I wish we could have kept talking for, uh, for uh, an hour because he, he has a lot of great perspective on things. We talked about commodities being potentially overextended. We talked about the dollar potentially, uh, you know, uh, weakening a little bit and what that might mean. Also, you have to think about interest rates, right? We have the uh, dueling uh, potential narratives as the Fed raising rates and what that means, and also investors flying to safely given the escalation that we're seeing uh, in Europe. That's pushing yields down. What's interesting about that is if you look at the relative performance of value versus growth, it tends to match the movement in interest rates. So if rates are coming down, it tends to mean value stocks are underperforming growth stocks. Might be an interesting thing that lines up with the narrative that uh, Dale was sharing earlier. Second, we talked about the chart of Goldman Sachs as a representative of some of the financial stocks that are struggling. I think financials are a sector that's probably best to hold off on for now, given the uncertainty that we've seen and given the fact that they've rolled over uh, so significantly. When I'm looking at GS, when I'm looking at STT, State Street, I'm seeing stocks that have rotated from an accumulation phase to a distribution phase. I'd much rather own stocks that are starting to go higher as opposed to ones that are, uh, you know, sort of cementing a downward trend. And that's what I'm seeing right now with Goldman Sachs. I would be eyeing that January low if you're owning a stock like that right now. Finally, semiconductors, the SMH. This often is a good leading indicator for the markets. Semiconductors tend to do well when the markets are healthy. When the markets are struggling, semiconductors tend to uh, be struggling as well. Head and shoulders alert, just like the S&P 500, same thing on the SMH. Look at the low from October. That lines up pretty well with the low from January. That's also from the low, low from the last week. The SMH gets below 250. This chart all of a sudden starts to look very much weak relative to what it has been previously. Folks, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close. All of our previous interviews on our on-demand platform, StockChartsTV.com. Thanks to Dale Pinkert 
joining us from California. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe, have a great night. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.